So we're carrying on through our Things Jesus Never Said series, so we'll end, finish next week. And the reason we're doing this series is because so much of what we believe about God and who He is and what the Bible says comes from what we imagine it says, what we would do if we were God, rather than allowing God to speak for Himself. Rather, right last week, we we looked at Jesus just wants you to be happy above everything else, which is a lie, but so often we think that way. If God loves us, surely He just wants me to be happy. He just wants me to go with every desire, every whim, every feeling, instead of surrendering to who He is and allowing Him and His Word to guide and direct us. And and today we're going to unpack, you won't have a bad day. Things Jesus never said, you won't have a bad day. Who had a bad day this week? Some of you, you had a good day. We can celebrate. Amen. Some of us had good days. But, but Jesus never said you won't have a bad day, a bad week, a bad year, a bad couple of years. Right? We read scripture. There's famine. There's hardship. There's desperation throughout for years and years on end. And when we read scripture, when we look at Jesus' life, when we look at the disciples' lives, when we look at pretty much the early church, there was lots of hardship and suffering and hard days going on. But it was all for a purpose. It was all for a refining that we would know the goodness and the mercy of God. And, and so many of us buy into this false belief that if we're believers, we will never have a bad day, right? And some preachers would even tell you, if you get sick, if you have a bad day, if you have financial struggles, it's because you lack faith, because you haven't given enough, because you haven't prayed enough, because you haven't repented enough. And sometimes our bad days are our own fault from poor decisions or whatever it is, but it's, it's not got to do with your faith per se. It's got to do with the fallen world we live in. It's got to do with life sucks sometimes. Amen. But life sucks, but Jesus is with us in the suck. And and that's what I want to speak about this morning. It's His goodness and His mercy. Jesus is about to ascend into heaven, um, and He's speaking to His disciples in John 16, 32 to 33. um, And He says, but the time is coming. Before that, verse 31, it says, do you believe this? Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe in His power and authority? Do you believe He's worth laying it all down for? Because that's what we just sang. I will worship you with everything I have. I will lay down my life for everything you are. Not in our own strength, but because we believe Jesus is the King of Kings. We believe Jesus came and died on the cross and was resurrected and he is worthy of it all. We believe Christmas is, he is the reason for the season. Amen. So, so if we believe that, that's what he's saying. He says, we believe that, but the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now when you will be scattered, each one going his own way, leaving me alone. So he's saying sometimes our circumstances will make us believe things that aren't true. It will make us believe Jesus is alone, and it will make us believe we are alone. And he says this, yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. The Christmas season is all about God is with us. Emmanuel, in every season we go through, every hardship, every struggle, where we do not know, where we do not know which way is up and down, the anchor beyond the veil holds us, and his name is Jesus. And that excites us because we will all have bad days. So that Bible's clear. Life is clear. And I'm jumping ahead, but we'll, we'll see. Don Carlson says, the, the, the only way to avoid suffering is your life is to not live long enough. <laughs> Otherwise, we're all going to suffer. But, but so back to the scripture. It says, yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. I've told you all this so that you may have peace in me. And even that, where do we find our peace? Jesus is very clear. There will be circumstances that are overwhelming. We will feel isolated and we will feel alone. But in the midst of that, there's a place that we can rest in the Prince of Peace called Jesus. And that's what he's trying. That's what I'm going to, in the midst of your hardship and your struggles and your confusion, there's a peace and his name is Jesus. It is not in changed circumstances. It is not in bigger bank balances. It is not in different political parties. It is in the Prince of Peace, Jesus. That's what Isaiah says, and we're going to read that in a moment as well. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows. If you've you've got your Bible with you, you can underline that, highlight that. Because we say, why God? Why? It's quite clear. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows. But take heart because I've overcome the world. Just take heart because what you endure, what you go through, the season of hardship and struggle, that's not the destination I have for you. What I have for you is a place of victory a place where I've overcome, a place where there's many rooms in my Father's house. That's where we're going for the goodness and the mercy of God. And and I read Joshua 1 again this week because I think sometimes we read biblical figures and we read stories and we view them through this misty lens that they are so great and powerful. I wish we were like the disciples or like the Old Testament prophets but we, uh, because they got a few things right and God used them mightily and blessed them mightily. We want to be like them. 
And we, we start to see as historic figures, they suffered with that, frustration, anxiety, bitterness, unforgiveness, all of those things we struggle with. And, and we place, well, if I'm going to be like a disciple, then I must never get anything wrong. And then we think of Peter um, or, 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 or Thomas or all of those guys. And I was reading Joshua 1 again, and, and you know, there'll be a number of verses that we, we all know and love. But, but God is giving jo- uh, Joshua this prep talk, right? This great commission for his life. He's saying, you can, he has the promise there, and I'm going to be with you like I'm with Moses. You can go and do anything. No one that comes against you will be able to stand. Um, and what's interesting, we love that verse because we think, okay, if God's with us like he's with Joshua, with Moses, there will be no hardship. We can just carry on going, but God's saying, I'm with you despite the opposition that's coming. I'm with you despite whatever it is that's going to come before you will roll out of the way because the presence of God goes with you. That we need not fear what comes next because God is with us as we approach it. And that's Joshua 1 verse 5. It says, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. And we love them. We go, yes, Lord, we can conquer. We can overcome. There'll be no obstacle big enough. But what we see in Joshua's life and, and, and the people around him, a lot of the doubt and trouble and anxiety came from within himself and within the people that God had called. Right, time and time again, you see those that doubted the most, those that struggled the most, those that had anxiety are the people that God had called for a greater task. Right, if ever there was a people group that could have walked in the awesomeness of God, it would have been Joshua and, and those guys entering the promised land. For sure, they knew the consequences of disobedience. They knew if we don't listen to God's commands in our lives right now, as He's speaking to us, we're going to land in the wilderness and be dead. Right? They experienced it. They understood the love and mercy of God that had sustained them for 40 years in the wilderness. They understood that God was with them and had promised them all these victories and and, and different changed circumstances, the land of milk and honey. They understood it. And then circumstances changed, whether favorable or difficult, and they forgot the hand of God in their life. Isn't that like all of us? We're prone to forget the hand of God that is with us in difficult circumstances. We allow what we see in the physical to determine our relationship with the spiritual. With God, we're saying, well, this is too overwhelming. This is too much. This is too much of a bad day or bad circumstance. How can God be with us? And and what we see in uh, Joshua, we see throughout Scripture, God is with us in the midst of battle. God is with us in the midst of hardship and struggles, and He's preparing us for His glory. He's refining us for His glory. Right? And and, and that's why it always, the Bible speaks about rejoice as a means of remembering, because you cannot praise, praise in itself is remembrance, right? When we rejoice, you have to think back of what you're rejoicing for. I can't tell you tomorrow I'm going to rejoice that the day's over, because I don't know what the day holds. I can look back and see God's faithfulness and blessing in my life, and I can rejoice, right? Small thing, on Thursday, I had toothache in the afternoon, phoned the dentist, and he's like, no, we'll see you next year. Uh, which is normal. <laughs> um, and, and then hung up five minutes later, he said, okay, I can see you tomorrow. Right? I look back at the faithfulness of God in my life and I can rejoice. Right? That when the Bible says rejoice, it says remember God. When we come to worship, we're not saying worship, the band's playing your favorite song or you like the rhythm. We're saying remember God and it will cause you to worship. If we're struggling to worship, if we're struggling to rejoice, we're forgetting God's hand in our life. And I'm not saying it to guilt you or shame you, but I'm trying to the Bible continually says, rejoice, which means remember God. We cannot rejoice if we're not remembering God. We cannot walk in obedience if we're not remembering God. Everything this morning pivots around. Remember, God is with you and He is for you, not against you. Right? And the hard truth we see, even with God saying, I was with Moses. And when I thought, God was with Moses for 40 years in the wilderness. And he had people moaning all day, every day. What must we eat? I don't like this food. It's not enough flavoring. The meat's overcooked. <laughs> Whatever it is, right? But God was with him. He spent his whole life pursuing something, the promises of God that he never got to enjoy. But he got to enjoy the person whom, which he served for eternity. Right? It's crazy. Following God's promises and guiding in your life does not mean you will not have hardship and struggles and complaining and difficulty. But it means God is with you and He is guiding and directing you. That's what you see. God being with you does not exempt you from hard days, from hard people, from hard choices. Right? We see again and again, most of our hard days, and we're jumping ahead again, is either from our own 
wrongdoing and silliness or other people's wrongdoing against us. Sinful people sin against sinful people. Hurt people hurt people. A lot of what you and I are carrying, the hurt, the pain, the frustration, is not even in our own sin. It's the sins of other people against us. And that's why two weeks ago we looked at we need to just forgive. Because we cannot walk in the lightness and the likeness of Christ if we will not forgive. And that's the, the promise. God said he would never leave us nor forsake us. He never ever said life would be easy. So when we're feeling overwhelmed and we're feeling isolated and alone and no one cares, we hold on to the truth of Scripture that God is with us. We combat the lies of the enemy that, that causes us to, to um, disconnect whatever it is with God is with me. And, and for most of us, we're either going into a hard season, coming out of a hard season, or in between. But what this means is we don't need, life is full of seasons, right? We, and, and that's why we have spring, winter, summer, um, all in one day, sometimes in J-Bay. But life is full of seasons. We know that. Some seasons are made for abundance, blessing, and we're enjoying the fruit of life and everything. Others is hardship and toil and, and frustration and bitterness or whatever it is. But irrespective of what season is awaiting us, we need not fear because God is already there. So that's what we, because so many of us are anxious about the next year, right? Which political party? What's going to happen here with the president? What's going to happen with the finances or the interest rates or this, that? And we can't control any of that, but we know that God is with us irrespective of what happens. Right? Irrespective, God is with us. You may lose everything next year, right? That's not what you want to hear the pastor say. <laughs> it's not prophetic. Don't worry. Um, but God will be with you if you lose everything. You may gain everything and God will be with you. And those he gives, much much will be expected. But God is with us. And that's what I quoted Don Carson says, If you live long enough, you will suffer. The only alternative to not suffering is not living long enough. Bad days will come. Bad days for some of you are here. Bad seasons are here. But fear not, God is with you in the midst of it. God has not canceled his promise over you. God is not withholding his blessing over you. He is refining you and carrying you through that others may see his glory. We see it. Even with Joshua, he goes into the promised land only to find hardship and opposition. And if we're honest, this hardship and bad days make us question God's goodness. Right? Like, where is God? What is God doing? How can I trust God? What are, and, and, and we come back to Scripture. We come back to, okay, what is God doing? Where is He leading? Why is these things happening in our lives? And some answers to, to your hardship will only be the other side of eternity. When we stand face to face with God and when we stand in his presence, we won't care about any of the answers. I'm not minimizing your pain. I'm maximizing what glory looks like for all of us. We will be in the goodness of God and we won't care about the things stubbing our toes on earth. Because what awaits us is so much greater that the sting has, or death has lost its sting. In the presence and the glory of God. God continually says, trust in me. Proverbs 3, 5. Fix your eyes on me. Hebrews 12, verse 2. Let me increase while you decrease, John 3.30. So when we go through bad days, when we go through hardship, what do we do? We practice Scripture. I'm going to trust in God. It's crazy, I know, but I'm going to trust. But a God that can roll apart the Red Sea, that can have a virgin birth, that can die and lay down his life and pick it back up, that's where I want to put my trust when I don't understand. Because I don't understand my bank balance, I don't understand the government, I don't understand ESCOM, and I may not understand God's ways, but he's shown me that he's faithful and good. That's where we're going to put our trust in. And we're going to work and we're going to fix our eyes on Him. Lord, I don't know where to look. I'm overwhelmed. I'm anxious. I'm going to, on my knees, fix my eyes on you. I'm going to work every day to increase you in my life and decrease me. God is continually through our struggles, moving us closer to Him and moving us away from center stage. And originally when I had that sentence, I said, God is moving closer to us. And then the Lord said, I'm constant. You're the one that's moving. God is constant in our lives. He is always with us, always there. We just aren't aware always of his presence and his guiding in our lives. But he's moving us closer to him that we would know the loving heart of God, that we would overflow to those around us, that we would reflect the glory and the worth of God in the hardship that we endure. And, and ultimately, he's moving us off center stage because God is so gracious that he will not take the glory in our lives if we will not get out his way but he's waiting and he's leading us through paths of difficulty, of hardship to refine us, to reflect his glory. God is constant in our lives. He wants to lead us to a position where we are loved and a position, position of surrender and sustained by God. So Jesus doesn't say you won't have bad days. We've crossed that already. 
he did say he will never waste anything in your life. I hate wasting leftovers, and that's why I I love having chickens, because we just give them everything, and nothing goes to wait, and then we eat it the next day in a different form. Um, God, God, (laughs) sorry. Um, God wastes nothing in your life. Your biggest shame, your biggest frustration, your biggest obstacle, your biggest hurt, God promises he will not waste it. God promises this restoration. God promises he will use that for his glory when we surrender and lay it down time and time again which in a strange way that works only because of the grace of God, our bad days are not the end of the world because God will use it for His glory, which means it is a great day. Whatever season and hardship you endured, maybe years, whatever it is, God promises to use it for His glory. The, 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 the crux of that is one day when we get to heaven, you will see faces that you, you recognize because of the, how you went through hardship and struggle for God's glory. And, and, and we'll be overwhelmed by just the goodness of God in that. God doesn't waste those things. So why do bad things happen? Bad days happen sometimes. Three, three kind of main reasons. Obviously, there's lots of nuances in them. But because of the attacks of the enemy. Right? Satan hates you. It shouldn't be a surprise. He hates your marriage. He hates your finances. He hates every aspect of you when you take God seriously. And, and, and so he will move and influence and do all things in your life to make sure there's obstacles for you to continually trip over, to make sure that you're blinded. That's why he calls us to community so that we can see the blind spots in our lives and hold each other accountable because there are things that we will not see that we will continually fall over. Sometimes because of other people, spoke about it, sinful people sin against people, right? Hurt people hurt people. Some people are just mean. Some people are are jealous. Some people are frustrated. Some people are just hurting and they don't know how to express anything but through emotional rants and outbursts and and hatred. And and, and it breaks my heart to see people on the receiving ends of this, but it's the reality of the life we live in. Never underestimate the depravity of an individual apart from Christ. The only reason we aren't as bad as we could be is because of the grace of God that has kept us and carried us and the Holy Spirit that has convicted us and led us to our knees. We have to understand that. So we're gracious in that, but we we understand life sucks sometimes. And and some of you are living in the consequences from sins against you from years and years ago. And you're forgiven and, and everything's good and you've got nothing left to do but just walk with the Lord. But the hardship still exists. It's there. Sometimes because of ourselves. Foolish people do foolish things. (laughs) <laughs> right? Some of us are living in bad consequences, bad days because of choices we make on a daily basis, choices we made 10, 20, 30 years ago, and we're still just figuring those things out. And, 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 and that's why life is hard sometimes. But through all of those things, God says, I am with you. And, and, and from, the, the very, very, from the outside, it's very hard to discern or give word of insight into people's lives with these things that can come across judgmental or whatever it is. So what we do, what we're called to do when people have bad days is to show up. Show up and speak about one thing that we know above and above everything else, the goodness of God, the grace of God, the sustainability of Jesus in our lives. And we, we share it from a place that overflows. To speak what we know, which is the love of God to those around us. And you ever, you ever have that week where, where you're sick um, or life's overwhelming, you forget what day it is. I often forget what day it is, but I only work on Sundays, so it's the only day I need to know. Um, but life just gets overwhelming, and I'm not speaking now. I think self-care is vitally important. Jesus napped. He's my hero. Uh, but we, we just so, sometimes self-care isn't possible. Sometimes we can't look after ourselves. And, and so often the reality of life is sometimes privilege, um, rest is a privilege not everyone gets to enjoy. So when you're in a season where there doesn't seem to be reprieve, when there doesn't seem to be any hope, when there doesn't seem to be any way that you can rest, even a five-minute nap seems like the world will crumble. And sometimes we just need a nap and, and trust God. But the thing is life doesn't stop when your body does. Life doesn't stop. We've said every time we do a funeral, life goes on. And, and, and it shifts and it changes. There's no timeouts. There's no retakes. So we cannot keep going at the pace that we're going and expecting things to be different. We need to come to a point where we say, okay, how do we weather these bad days? And it's by resting on the rock of our salvation, Jesus. 
Because it's easy to say, just take a break or do this or whatever it is. But sometimes it really isn't possible in those moments. And we add more guilt and shame on those people that aren't able, whatever it is. But the truth is, irrespective of how much rest you're getting, you can find, you can find strength in God. That's Psalms 18 verse 2. It says, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my Savior. My God is my rock, in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me, and my place of safety. The psalmist is not putting his hope in maybe getting some rest in December or in what comes next year. He's putting his hope and his rest in Christ and Christ alone. And, and the beauty of this is, is so often as humans, depends on how, how, you, how your leave cycles and everything work, we kind of put all our hope in this once a year refreshing, right? <laughs> Where the psalmist says every day is refreshed in the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit to get through whatever it is that day holds. Right? And it, refreshing once a year, twice a year, five times a year, whatever it is that you're able to do, do it as much as you can. And, and, and we need to learn to be a people that live from rest and not live towards rest. But I want to encourage you where rest does not seem possible, rest on the rock of your salvation. And his name is Jesus. It's what we see. The question is, where are we putting our hope? Where are we putting our focal point? Because bad days lead us to be hopeful in everything else but Jesus. Right, a bad day, a bad month, a bad season. Better, we hope for better finances, different political party, um, new electrical powers, whatever it is, new marriage or better marriage, whatever it is. Right, it's always in those things. The psalmist says, "God is your rock. Build your hope on the rock of your salvation and nothing else." We are not designed to carry the sins, or, or our own sins. Christ is. We're not designed to carry the weight of other people's sins. Christ is. That's what Isaiah 9 verse 6, um, and it's a great Christmas verse. Isaiah 9 verse 6 to 7 says, For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and his peace will never end. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of heaven's armies will make this happen. It's just, and, and the, the midst of this the prophecy is in the midst of war and famine and hardship and drought and all of these things going on. And, and its promises in the midst of storms and hardship, there's a peace and his name is Jesus. In the midst of your bad day, his name is Jesus. Psalms 46, we, we, Vicky shared it at our Bible studies on Wednesday Eve, or Chirikas Bible studies on Wednesday Eve, and we love it. Be still and know that I am God. Right, and, and we kind of just all get this idea that you're just going to meditate on the beach and be still before God. But Psalms 46 starts with an earthquake. And then it goes on to war and fathom. And, and in the midst of all the chaos of life and the hardship of life and everything going on, it says, be still, trust in God. It's a, it's a proactive place in your full assurance and weight that God is able, that He is with you in the midst of your bad day. That's why Joshua 24, 15, again back to Joshua, he just says, And if it's evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river. Right? And, and it's a good thing if you're a child to go to the same church as your parents. Otherwise, it's going to start trouble. Joshua is saying, look, you can please your parents. You can please whoever it is that you need to please in life. If you think God's not worthy of laying it down for you, go with what? You go with that. It says, whether it's a God or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. He's saying, cool, we live amongst these Amorites. If we're going to follow God, it's going to cause hardship and struggles. He's saying, just go with the culture. Culture seems quite nice today. Kind of watered down Christianity, watered down all these things. There's no real commitment, no real whatever it is. We can still say God, but... As long as we, we just tone it down. Then he says, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. He's saying in the midst of we're going to choose to worship people, worship comfort and culture, or worship the God of God. In the midst, and, and when we choose to worship God, it sometimes creates bad days. And he says, Joshua draws the line and says, we will serve God. We will honor God. We will pursue God. And Joshua builds faith by looking back again. Right By rejoicing at the hand of God that led them out of Egypt, that led them through the wilderness, everywhere God has carried them and been with them. He's calling the people that are struggling to make a commitment to look to the hands of God. He's not giving some motivational speech on, on do better, be better, tithe more, come to church more, pray more. He's saying look to God and allow that to be your guide because He is worthy of it all. 
And, and it's a beautiful picture that he's just saying God is worthy of it all. And he's reminding the people God is worthy of it all. In John 16, Jesus is about to, as we started with this morning, he's about to give his final words to the disciples. His final instruction in the face of difficulty and loss. And he's saying, you'll feel things that you've never felt before. You'll feel abandoned. You'll feel betrayed. You'll have the worst day ever. But know this, I am with you. The Holy Spirit is with you. What you endure today will be preparation for what comes next. And I love that. Some of you just need to hear that this morning. Your hardship, your struggles, God is preparing you for what comes next. It makes absolutely no sense to you right now. It actually frustrates you that I say that. But God is preparing you for a season that you cannot know or don't even think about. But He's praying over your life. What you endure today, you will be a preparation for what comes next. God says, I won't waste your hurt. I won't waste your pain. I won't waste your position. I'm preparing you for my name's sake, for kingdom glory. And we see that throughout Scripture. When men and women of God have a bad day, God is in preparation. Because we say it time and time again, God cares more about character than anything else. It's character over calling, character over comfort, time and time again. He pulls us back to that truth. Romans 5, verse 3 to 5. We can rejoice, right? We can rejoice. Whenever you read rejoice, you just say, remember God. Look, I'm, you know, if you're like, I'm now this is a sermon all of itself. I'm struggling to worship. I'm struggling to be happy in Christ and think of Rejoice, remember God. Make a rejoice list. Okay, I want to remember God's hand. Okay, when did he guide me? When did he help me? When did he comfort me? When did he, whatever it is. And we learn to rejoice. We can rejoice, remember God, when we run into problems and trials. Again, the focal point is not the problems and trials. The focal point is remembering a God that is with you. Run into problems and trials, for we know that they helped us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us because He has given the Holy Spirit to fill our, li- or fill our hearts with His love. Our bad days show us the, fu- the, the futileness of resting on ourselves and, and the joy of resting in God and God, God alone. So when we have a bad day, we say, we don't say thank you, God, for the bad day. We say, thank you, God, that you have not forgotten me. Thank you, God, that you are refining me. Thank you, God, that you are making me into an image bearer worthy of your name. That's Romans 8, 28 and 29. We see that. We may not agree to it with it, but we just say, thank you, God. Everything we go through is an opportunity to love and reflect Jesus to the people around us. And we see, tell me through Scripture, Jesus delivers us from pain, not from bad days. Or he delivers us from sin, not from pain. But He carries us through every issue and trouble we go through. And if sin has lost its eternal sting, of, if, if He has delivered us from the eternal sting of sin, we are no longer bound with shame for it. Some of us have bad days because of the shame of our sin. And Christ says there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Romans 8 verse 1. There's nothing that disqualifies you. There's nothing that separates you from the love of God as His children. God loves you and has set you free. We need to learn to repent and walk away from our sin into the future that God has from us. Irrespective of the hardship and the bad days, God wants to set us free that we would walk in that. And ultimately today, even as we we prepare for the table, ultimately you must believe God loves you and delights in you. Ultimately, you have to believe God is for you, not against you. Ultimately, you have to believe that God is a good father, unlike some earthly fathers, unlike uh, things that we may have experienced in our lives. God is good. God is for me, not against me. God is redeeming me. He's refining me. He's sculpting me to reflect the glory of His Son. He is not punishing me. There may be earthly consequences we have to wrestle through, but God We believe He is good and for us. He delights in us. That He's working things for good to those who believe. The crushing and the hardship, He's making you into a person of faith. He's making us into a people of faith. He's making us a people of character. That when hardship comes, when bad days come, we will still have a character worthy of the calling on our lives. Because nothing reflects our true character like the hardship we endure on a daily basis. And God understands the importance that our character reflect His heart. His, in His nature. God has called us to be a holy nation and reflect His glory, His patience and His love. And we need Jesus for that. We need to surrender to that. We need to come to the point that God, that we understand that God is with us. And I've said already, there will be great joy in heaven one day when we see that God has used our hardship, our suffering, our sickness, our pain to draw lost people to Him. Nothing will be wasted. 
Keep an internal perspective as you suffer and go through bad days that God is with you, that he's refining you, that he's, he's molding you to reflect his glory. It has to encourage us a little this morning that he is with us. And one day we will see the fullness of what God has over our lives when we stand with him and, and everything will be seen in the right perspective. But ultimately, we, we fix our eyes on Jesus this morning. We come to the communion table and we say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for the full life, death, and resurrection. Thank you, Jesus, that as we go into the Christmas season, He truly is the reason for the season. He truly is the reason that we are able to worship and adore and come to Him in our bad days because He has laid the path. He has leveled the ground at the foot of the, at, at His feet that we're able to come to Him this morning, irrespective of how bad your week's been, how bad your years have been, how far you've wandered, how far you've uh, strayed, whatever it is. He says you're welcome because of what He has achieved, what He has done. And it's so important we tension that with our bad days because so often we think, well, it's just, I can't. And God's like, I've already with you. I've made a way. Just come to, come to me. And I always, when we, we speak about coming to Jesus, I always get the picture of, uh, of the four friends that just ripped the roof off. And there's debris and there's chaos and there's noise. You can't rip a roof off a house without it being messy. And, and it's messy. We come to Jesus, it's messy. We come to Jesus and we want to be at his feet and we want to hear his teaching and, we want to, and it's going to be messy. It's going to be painful, but we have to do something to come into or, or rip the roof off and just lay there at his feet. So maybe this morning you just need to bring your bad day to Jesus and as we take um, communion, maybe you just need to lay down before you partake of the elements and say, Lord, I, I've been struggling. There's a disconnect. I'm having a bad day, a bad month, a bad year. Show me your presence. Show me your hand, God, because there's no way you've made it this far if the hand of God hasn't been in your life. And, and, and I'm not being um, sarcastic there. If you are here this morning, God has held you and directed you and loved you in ways we cannot imagine or think. So when we, we pray this morning as we go to the elements, we say, Lord, show me your hand. I want to be able to rejoice because your hand is over my life. I don't need to understand it, but it's there. And, and, and just that we would come and rejoice and remember remember what Christ did on the cross for you and I to lay down his life and pick it up so as the band comes up I just want to these on you again um, just a, a reminder of how they work if you just peel the top paper off that top one and then this one clips and you can open it um, so yes so I'm going to pray um, and then the band will, will play and then please come up Grab an element, go back to your seats, and then in your own time this morning, I know we often eat and drink together, but in your own time, do the work with the Lord this morning. Ask Him to reveal His hand in your life, His goodness, His mercy, His grace, and that you would turn all of that to rejoice in remembrance of what He did on the cross for you and I. So let's pray. Yes, Lord, we just come before you this morning, Lord, and we thank you, Lord, that ultimately you are with us. You offer us a peace, a shalom peace that is not based on this world. It is not based on our understanding. It is not based on our circumstances. It is based on the presence of you in our lives, and you are always with us, Lord. So, Lord, we pray this morning, they, they, like you did with Paul, there's scales on our eyes sometimes that we cannot see your hand. We're overwhelmed by just the darkness and the decay and the difficulty of the circumstances we find ourselves in that you would guide and direct us, Lord. Lord, reveal to us your hand in our darkest moments. Reveal to us your love as we navigate life, Lord. So, Lord, we just lay it all down, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We just want to say thank you that you're with us in the darkest moments, Lord. We don't know how to comprehend that, Lord, and why things happen, but we know there's hurt people, hurt people, sinful people, sin against us, Lord. But we know you were there, Lord. We know your heart breaks with our hearts, Lord. Lord, we thank you that you will use everything the enemy meant for evil, you will use for good. Wherever the enemy has attacked and left scars and hurt, Lord, that you would plant your seeds of righteousness, of forgiveness, or of just joy, Lord. Where the enemy has laid cuts, Lord, you would lay your mercy and your grace, Lord that we would walk in the freedom you have for us, Lord. So we just thank you that you are with us this morning, Lord. 
Thank you that irrespective of what next year holds, you, you are with us, Lord. Whatever season we go into next, you are with us, Lord. So we just say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In your wonderful mighty name, thank you, Jesus. Amen.